All right, good evening, everybody. We'll get started officially in a few minutes. Give just a minute or two for the public to log on. I'm just scanning the pan, uh, the attendee list to see if we're missing anybody from that group. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm once again uh, Chris Record, Superintendent of Cape Schools. Uh, really pleased to be here tonight uh, with several stakeholders involved in our district planning committee. Um, I just ask the committee um, when you do speak, just remind uh, the public and each other, perhaps, who you are. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to go around around the room tonight because um, uh, I want to move things along. Uh, so tonight we are having our second district planning committee meeting. Uh, this group is designed really to provide feedback uh, to the school board and school administration on all COVID related matters. Um, this group met last year, uh, I believe started meeting in the spring, if not earlier. Um, and we last met on uh, August 4th. Um, our goal tonight is to come up with our final recommendations to the school committee, uh, uh, excuse me, school board <laughs> for consideration at the 816 meeting. So that's 630 this coming Monday. Uh, that will be in town hall. And just a reminder to anyone that attends that meeting, um, masks are required, uh, I believe, in all town buildings right now. So I just keep that in mind. Our norms uh, that we established last meeting are to be respectful of each other, uh, share the air, meaning giving everyone a chance to speak. Uh, aim for a consensus model to see if we can uh, agree on our recommendations. And I really want us to conclude by 8.30, if not earlier. Uh, it is still August, and uh, I know all of our people in this meeting uh, have summer on their minds, hopefully. And so if we get done earlier, that'd be great to give everyone a summer evening, uh, including those watching at home. Uh, reminder to everyone watching and those in the panel, uh, this is being recorded. Uh, recording will be shared, as will the uh, the notes we take uh, on this meeting, the minutes. Um, we're really trying to be transparent on this process as we figure it out together. Uh, reminder, our underlying goal, uh, really committed to this, is to have all Cape Elizabeth students and staff safely in school full time for the 21-22 school year. Um, that's our underlying goal. That's our purpose. That's why we're trying to figure these things out. Um, and as I said last time, I'm really hopeful as we process and then the school board does on Monday, we can make some decisions around COVID and then start the school year, of course, with COVID in mind, but also really start focusing on teaching and learning again. Um, I really want us to get back to that. Um, and if you're wondering, this group will continue to meet throughout the year. Um, we will be examining all the data and input um, and we will be willing to make adjustments or recommend adjustments to the school board as the year goes by. So I don't want anyone to think any recommendations we make or that the school board votes on on Monday are static for the rest of the year. We will revisit because um, we're going to find out more information as the year goes by. Um, so that's our goal. That's our, our norms, process, and purpose. Um, and I'm not going to stay on this agenda the whole time because I want to see everyone's faces. Um, but some resources that have been shared with this group, and they're also on the agenda that's been shared with the public. Um, these are helping guide our deci decisions, excuse me, uh, about COVID. So please look at them, examine them, uh, welcome the public to, to look at those um, and see what you see. Um, just highlighting, I know uh, I mentioned last time we're working on an FAQ. Uh, we will get that out to you. Um, so 
as you're writing comments perhaps tonight or questions in the question and in, or the um, comment section um, or the chat section of Zoom, we will capture those questions and we will get answers to you. Uh, I promise we will answer every question. Um, I think that's real important. Uh, so please know your questions will be seen. They will be answered. And yes, the school board will see those questions as well. Um, they are well informed and will be well informed when they make choice this choices on Monday. So uh, we're going to move forward and please raise your hand anyone that wants to add anything at any time. Um, just a little update. I know Dr. Shaw gave us some information. We reviewed this last time about COVID-19 cases in, increasing. Um, we mentioned that last time. Um, and I just added a little more information since our last meeting. Uh, Maine's seven-day average of new cases has climbed to levels not seen since May. Um, and 60 people were hospitalized on Wednesday. That's the most since June 6th. Um, Cumberland County, this wasn't true, I don't think, when we last met, or maybe it happened that evening. Um, but Cumberland County has now moved into the substantial level. Um, and you can click on that uh, link to see how COVID data is tracked around the state. Um, so that's good underlying information for us to have. Cases are increasing uh, throughout the state and in Cumberland County. Um, we met last time. The minutes are here. Uh, certainly anyone can review them, the public or, or the panel. Um, some outcomes from that. Um, the commit, committee recommended universal masking for all people in our schools, no matter vaccination status. The school board will consider that on Monday and, and vote on that. Uh, we determined to revisit the discussion of pool testing tonight. Um, and we determined to revisit other mitigation measures um, before we conclude this me meeting. So last meeting, as you recall, we talked about pool testing. Uh, we verbally talked about it tonight. We're actually going to present something uh, so you can see it. Um, but I uh, just want you to know the main CDC um, is highly recommended uh, this. Uh, the CDC, main CDC, Dr. Shaw, um, all of our nurses, uh, school doctor, everyone with medical training on this panel, all was supporting pool testing. Um, however, we did have some questions about it last meeting, so we decided not to recommend it, so we had a chance to talk further. So that's what we're going to do tonight. So I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, let's see here. And I'm going to turn it over. Actually, I think, Aaron, you're going to share your screen. Yep, Aaron, I'll share my screen. Aaron Taylor is our outstanding Pond Cove nurse, and uh, I believe Jill Young, who's equally outstanding, uh, outstanding middle school nurse. Um, they've compiled this presentation uh, on pool testing, really so everyone on the panel and the public um, can get a better understanding of what it is. Uh, once we conclude this presentation, uh, I'm gonna turn to each school nurse and our school doctor to see if they wanna add anything and then open it up to the panel for thoughts and questions. And we will talk about that question about the mental health impact of testing. I know that was brought up last time. So Jill, go ahead. All right, we'll take it away here. So um, before we start this presentation, I just wanted to restate our goal again. Our goal is to keep this highly transmissible and potentially deadly virus out of our school, keeping our students and faculty in our schools. The most effective way to do this is, involves a layered mitigation measure approach and pooled testing is one of those layers, along with vaccination, masking when, while indoors, um, hand hygiene, and distancing. All right, so pooled testing. Go ahead, Erin. I'm going to have to change my view so I can see the slides here. Hang on just a moment. Let me minimize our grid. Okay, so the purpose of this presentation is to provide a baseline understanding, and we tried to simplify it as much as we could so that it was really clear of what pooled testing is and how it work, would work in those schools or districts in Maine who choose to use it as a mitigation measure. So again, Cape Elizabeth Schools has not made any decision about using pooled testing beginning in the fall at this time. This is simply to provide more information and get feedback about the option of offering this mitigation measure on site. So who would this involve? 
all Cape Elizabeth School Department students and staff, both vaccinated and unvaccinated, are encouraged to participate in the pooled testing program. Participation is voluntary and consent is required. Families determine their child's participation and may opt in or out at any time. The main CDC and the main Department of Education endorse pooled testing in schools. Each pool or batch will consist of approximately 20 students and staff who likely interact with one another routinely throughout the school day. So what is it? We talked about this a little bit last week, but let's make it really clear. What are we talking about here? So pooled PCR, that's the more accurate of the tests available. Pooled PCR testing is a mitigation measure and is a more efficient way to test large groups of students and staff in schools on a weekly basis. Pooled testing involves collecting swabs from small groups of students and staff, usually in a class cohort, then placing the swabs in the same test tube, mixing several test samples together in a batch, or as this is referring to a pool, and then testing that pooled sample with a PCR test for detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So what this PCR pool allows for is increased testing, faster results, and lower costs. So what if the pooled test results are negative? If the results in a pool are negative, all students and staff included in that pool continue to attend school without any disruption. Pool testing will be conducted again the following week. What if the pool test comes back as positive? So if that pool test result is positive, the individuals in that pool or that batch of test swabs continue to attend school as scheduled and will be tested at school in a private setting, protecting their confidentiality by using a rapid antigen test called Binex Now to identify the positive case or cases. The individual or individuals who test positive with that rapid test will be sent home to isolate for 10 days. What impact does this have on contact tracing and quarantine? Close contacts, and again, close contacts are defined as those within six feet of the individual who tested positive for greater than 15 cumulative minutes will be identified as close contacts. Asymptomatic close contacts, so they don't have any symptoms, but they were identified as a close contact and they participated in pooled testing and tested negative. Both vaccinated and unvaccinated continue to attend school without disruption. So the next bullet point, if you're asymptomatic, no symptoms, identified as a close contact, but you did not participate in the pooled testing, but you're vaccinated, you continue to attend school without disruption, but are encouraged to be tested at, an, at a site outside of school in three to five days, Masking in all indoor settings, not just at school, this is CDC guidance. So masking in all indoor settings until a negative result is obtained. So a little more on that. The, um, the reason why those that don't participate in the pooled testing um, and are vaccinated and the test is recommended three to five days later, the reason that that needs to be a site outside of school is currently our Binex Now tests are provided to us through a grant and we have certain situations that we can use those tests for that are free of charge to our schools. One situation is this um, pooled testing. When we have um, a positive pool come back, we can use them for that situation. We can use them if we have a staff member who's identified as a close contact um, for serial testing, so daily testing for them to keep them in the classroom. And we can use them for individuals in our school community, so faculty and students who become symptomatic at school. So those are the three situations we can use the Binex Now tests that are provided through a federal grant to our school. Those, but we cannot use it for people who do not participate in pooled testing who are vaccinated and asymptomatic close contact. So those individuals would need to go outside of school um, to arrange testing. The last bullet point, so an asymptomatic, again, no symptoms, close contact, who does not participate in the pooled testing and is not vaccinated, will be sent home to quarantine for 10 days following CDC guidance. So where is this all happening? 
All the testing for the program is conducted at school. Pooled testing will be done in the classroom. Uh, there may be some other situations, um, sports teams and different things where it may be done elsewhere, but as of now, the way it looks, pooled testing will be done in the classroom. If a pooled test batch results as positive, those individuals in that pool will be tested at school in a private setting using the Binex Now rapid antigen test to identify the positive case. Students and staff collect their own nasal swab samples. And before I continue, just on the um, last bullet point, um, again, so if we have a positive test, the individuals will be tested at school. So even if we get it at 5 p.m. the night before, um, those students will come back to school to be tested. Again, that's using the rationale and the information that's come, you know, that we've learned over the last year, year and a half year about COVID-19, where these pooled tests, so we had a negative swab from this pool last week. So we know we've caught it early. We're having all this layered, all these layered mitigation measures in place. So they'll come into school and be tested to find the individual or individuals who are positive at school. And then once we know and have confirmed that positive, those would be the individuals who would be sent home. Those individuals along with individuals who did not participate in the pool and are unvaccinated. Close contacts. All right, when are we gonna do this? So pool testing is performed weekly on a regular schedule in homeroom classrooms. The pooled PCR tests are resulted in 24 to 48 hours. And those included in a positive pool test will have the Binex Now rapid antigen test performed at school upon receiving the result to identify the positive individuals. Why? What are the benefits? So first of all, pool testing aligns with Cape Elizabeth School Department's goal to have all Cape Elizabeth students and staff safely in school full time for the 2021-22 school year. So how does it align with that? So it gets our school to full capacity full time. It protects against disruptions from quarantine. Vaccines do not offer full protection. They offer pretty good protection. We're very thankful um, to have that, but it's not full protection, especially with the new Delta variant. Though thus far the vaccine has prevented severe disease. It helps to minimize school transmission via early detection. So like we talked about, we're finding out early and it's reducing that transmission. It protects against COVID-19 surges. It prevents families from the um, effects of quarantine by missing work and school. So it prevents that. It's relatively non-intrusive testing. Again, it's a nasal swab. It's not a nasal pharyngeal swab. It's a nasal swab just in the inside of the nostril. Provides families confidence in the face of all the potential variants, child vulnerability, and vaccine lagging. And it reduces the need for distancing during surges. So I want to, before we continue on, I wanna talk about what's the benefits for vaccinated. So right now we know if we are a close contact and we're vaccinated, if we're asymptomatic, whether I participated in the pool or not, I can still come to school, but it's recommended that I get a test in three to five days. So that's one of the benefits. You would, if you're in the pool, you don't have to go off site to get that test. You're automatically gonna be tested the following week anyway. So you don't have to worry about finding a testing site, paying for a test, it's all taken care of. So that's one of the benefits. But um, the benefits for those that are vaccinated um, really fall under the early detection, which reduces transmission, which protects our community, which keeps our students and faculty in the schools and keeps our CAPE families well. So a great question came up when meeting with administration yesterday and it's valid um, and it's real. They're, these questions are all valid. Um, there's not a bad question about this. We're all learning together, but, um, and I had to think about it for a while, but so we have a 16 year old soccer player who's vaccinated and we think the majority of that soccer team is vaccinated. Um, the 16 year old thinks that, the family thinks that, we as a school community, we think, you know, we've got a high vaccination rate, which we do, which is amazing, unbelievable actually, but that's exciting in itself. But so the 16 year old, the parents are contemplating, well, is it really beneficial? Is it not? Like what's in it for us? Um, and that 16 year old is like, please don't sign me up because 
we've got a huge game this Friday and I feel fine today on Monday and I do not want to get tested in that pool of testing and find out I'm positive on Tuesday and miss the big game. So, I mean, that's real. That's, you know, how we would feel and process things. But when thinking about it, I thought, okay, right. We wouldn't want, you know, you're, we're thinking about how it would impact us and we don't want to miss that big game. But let's say, okay, Monday we feel fine, but come Wednesday, all of a sudden we don't feel so good. So we have to miss school anyway, because we're relying again on families with that honor system of following that checklist and keeping your child home when sick and faculty the same way, stay home when you're sick and definitely out of athletics when we're sick. So, um, cause if we miss school, we miss athletics. So uh, Wednesday comes and we don't feel good. And now we're missing school and I might miss that big game on Friday. And in the meantime, since I didn't participate in the pool testing, I felt fine on Monday. I'm positive, but don't know it until I'm symptomatic on Wednesday when I finally miss my first practice. But now I've spread it to more of my team. And now we can't feel the team because we have so many that are symptomatic and missing. So that's the real benefit is early detection, reducing transmission benefits our whole community and keeps us in school, um, keeps more people in school full time. Okay, thank you for that. All right, how does this happen? So school nursing staff, this is a bit daunting for us school nurses as I read this out loud, but school nursing staff will enroll and coordinate obtaining consent, determining participants and the testing pools, education, training, specimen collection and shipping, data entry, rapid antigen testing and reporting, contact tracing and communication to administration and the school community. Woo, that's a lot. But we are all fully behind this. And while I'm presenting this, again, like Dr. Record said, Smita Santi, our school physician, and all three of us school nurses stand behind this. And we are willing to do this because that's how strongly we feel about um, this layer of a mitigation measure and how it could positively impact our school. Um, and um, we also know that um, there's a possibility of maybe some support, but even without that, we are all in. Um, so pooled testing places minimal additional responsibilities on teachers. The idea is not to push this on teachers. And what we mean by minimal additional responsibilities, we are going to have to come into your classes Testing, as we're going to get down to on a couple bullet points, takes about five to 10 minutes um, once we have this kind of under our belts and we get in a routine. Um, but we are the one of one res, a minimal additional responsibility would be we would have a schedule where we come into your classroom that would take some of that time away from your instruction. And we may ask for your help in distributing the packages of swabs to those on the roster. But that would be about the only responsibilities on teachers. Hmm. Um, testing would be conducted weekly again um, in first period classrooms is what we're looking at that might change a little bit like we talked about earlier, um, depending how it would look and who enrolls. The process is expected to take five to 10 minutes once we have the hang of things. Students and staff collect their own nasal swabs and students and staff may opt in or out of the program at any time. And this is a big one, testing, just like those test kits, those Binex Now kits that we have, testing is offered free of charge to main schools. So both pooled testing and the Binex Now rapid antigen tests are free of charge to main schools. What does pooled testing look like? I'm gonna just show this quick video. I'm gonna have Aaron play it actually, but just to give you an idea of what it might look like. Thank you. 
right. Ooh. Sorry. That's all right. There we go. There we go. All right. So this flow chart came from um, Maine Academy of um, Pediatrics. Um, and it just goes through the flow chart similar to what we've already worked through in some of our previous slides. Um, but it just shows their support of this as well and the flow chart. Um, so samples are collected from students and staff once a week. Um, this is something we haven't talked about yet, but you would exclude those from the pool who test positive for COVID-19 for 90 days to be sure that um, that isn't the reason that your pool or batch would test positive. Pooled samples are delivered to the lab for processing via overnight FedEx or courier. We'll start on the left. If the pooled test result is positive, all members are tested individually using the Abbott by Next Now rapid antigen test. The by Next Now tests do not identify positive individuals from the pool. Then you would go down and repeat testing the following day or within two days, whichever is sooner. If no positive individual is identified, then proceed with next scheduled pool PCR test. If the by Next Now tests do identify positive individuals from the pool, then close contacts in the pool testing, the positive cases are isolated, and the remaining negative pool members and close contacts in testing program resume in-person learning and school activities. If the pool test is negative, now we're on the right in that green, then the pool members continue learning and instruction without inter interruption. Um, close contacts not in pool testing um, are quarantined except those who have tested positive in the last 90 days and those who are fully vaccinated. Um, but those that are fully vaccinated, again, need to be tested in three to five days after exposure. So my next slide is really busy and I'm gonna explain it to you. Um, but you know, if you've ever watched these before, I like visuals, so this is gonna be a visual, but you're gonna have to take it all in, but I'll walk you through it. So the red stick figure is the positive COVID-19 test. The shot represents vaccinated. The waves represent that they participated in a pooled testing or in the pooled testing. The red X is that they were identified as a close contact. The mask is a vaccinated close contact who was not in pooled testing. So per their per CDC guidance, they are to mask in all indoor settings until a negative test result is obtained. And again, that test has to come from an outside site if they didn't participate in pooled testing. So the masks represent that. Then there's borders. A red border indicates they're isolated or quarantined for at least 10 days. A green border means they can attend school without disruption. All right, don't get overwhelmed. I'm gonna, on this next slide, <laughs> it's busy. Okay, so what does pooled testing contact tracing look like? So Mrs. Young, seventh grade class, pooled testing batch, here we are. 20 students and one staff member. So there's 21 on here. 10 participated in pooled testing. So you can see the 10 stick figures with the waves floating around them. They participated in pooled testing. 11 of the individuals are vaccinated and our pooled test revealed one positive case. That's the red stick figure. We had 11 close contacts. So you can look and see the 11 red X's. And out of those 11 close contacts, only two were quarantined. And if we look at the quarantine, we can see one is um, unvaccinated and did not participate in the pool. And then that other one is the same, not vaccinated and did not participate in the pool. Um, then we have three wearing masks and we can see they were identified as close contacts, not in the pool, but vaccinated. So they're wearing their masks until they get their offsite test three to five days later that results as negative. And then you can see the benefits of, look at all those close contacts that were vaccinated and participated in the pool. Um, they have to mask indoors at school most likely and most likely a lot of places, but um, they are able to, all those vaccinated um, are able even as close contacts vaccinated and those that were in the pool are in school. So let's keep looking at this, but let's change Mrs. Young's class to a fourth grade class. Fourth grade class, 20 students, one staff member, 10 participated in pooled testing, 
none vaccinated. Well, let's say one's vaccinated. We might have a staff member. Let's say it's vaccinated. Um, one positive case. So what would that look like? So we don't have any of those vaccinated. So look how many more we would have as close contacts. Now, I didn't really do this until just now, so bear with me. But um, take those close contacts with a vaccine away. Um, so we've got one, two, three, four, five more. Five. Oh, I'm sorry. I have to go back. Aaron, you should have jumped in here. But um, <laughs> so the, um, these, this grade level is not um, it's treated a little bit differently. So with the close contact that they have at Pond Cove, close contacts typically are the entire classroom. So um, just because of the movement around the classroom and um, and throughout the building, but in those lower grade levels. So let's take away um, all those vaccines. And Erin, you may have to help me out, but what, what are we left with here? Let's see. Well, so I think the one thing to mention is just like Jill said, because of the movement in Pong Cove throughout the day and the fact that these kids in Pong Cove are cohorted all day long in the same pod versus kids at the middle school or high school where they're constantly changing classrooms. Um, and just given their age and how they're going to interact, their allied arts, lunch, recess, whatnot, it's much harder to be able to say that you know, this student at the far left had no contact with a student at the far right for more than 50 minutes in a day. That's um, asking a lot of our teachers and um, it just really changes the flow, the natural flow that we really want to have in an elementary school environment. Um, so it's, it's what we did last year was that if we had a case, it was all the kids in this classroom were considered close contacts. And that's what we're looking at as of right now, moving forward. So if all of these were close contacts, it looks like we have um, those that would be quarantined would be all of those that did not participate in the pooled testing. Um, so it would be what the 11 that didn't participate in the pooled testing would all be quarantined. So, but those that participated in the pool and tested negative would continue to attend school as scheduled. All right. And this is, um, I, Dr. Record shared this link to Dr. Shaw's briefing on July 29th. And this is just a clip from that on pool testing. Other layered mitigation measures that we wanna talk about today that we recommend that schools take up. The one that we're gonna to turn to next and one that for me is critical is surveillance level testing. You may know it as pool testing. Before I turn things over to Sally, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about pool testing and put my unequivocal see or my, my unequivocal stamp of support on. Pool testing refers to regular periodic testing of students, teachers, and staff within a school on a regular cadence to make sure that if there are cases of COVID-19, we catch them and we catch them early and make sure those kids who might be affected either with the disease itself or because of exposures to that person are given adequate public health advice. Pooled testing, along with some of the other things on this slide, like vaccinations, are part of the suite of efforts that we think will help keep kids just as safe this year as they were this past year. There have been questions about pooled testing, whether it's really useful, whether it's something we support, and whether it's something that schools should undertake. I want to be crystal clear. My answer to each and every one of those questions is an unequivocal yes. Pool testing has demonstrated its value time and time again, even in light of vaccinations. As we talked about a moment ago, we're not at the point now where every single child in a main school can be vaccinated. And thus, regular testing of not just the unvaccinated kids, but also the vaccinated kids will help detect any types of disease in case they happen to take hold in school. I want to say that last piece again and then turn it over to Sally. We recommend that not only does your school take up our offer to engage in pool testing, but that when you do so, you test everyone in the school, whether or not they're vaccinated. There are a number of reasons for that, which we can dive into. To start that conversation, I'm going to turn things over to Sally. Other layered Ooh. mitigation measures that we want to talk 
Okay, and I think we just have one last slide. Yes, this is just a reminder that symptomatic individuals should stay home and follow the school's guidance on returning to school following illness. So all this is in reference to those that did not have symptoms at school. Um, symptomatic should stay home. And then um, I think we'll, that's all that I have, but if the nurses or anybody else had anything uh, to add to thank it. You, thank you, Jill, very much for leading us through that and, and understanding it so well with your nurse colleagues. That's That gives me comfort, actually, that the three of you, along with our school doctor, know this so well. And, and I know you're going to continue to learn about it. So thank you. Um, I do want to I read Dr. Santi's um, opinion on this last meeting, but I did want to give her a chance to speak to us and the, the public about pool testing first. Go ahead, please. Sure, yeah, I'm sorry I missed last week's meeting, um, but did want to just sort of follow up. Um, thank you for the setup, and that was a great explanation of it. A few things that I just wanted to highlight based on that. Um, the first is just sort of the public health and community benefit from pool testing. Really, this is our contribution, everyone's contribution to making the school community safer. And your example of the 16 year old is a great one that they may not necessarily want to do that themselves for their own individual um, you know, plans, but as participation in the school programs and in the school efforts, you can see how valuable it might be. And so the more people that participate, certainly the better. Um, so just want to emphasize that, um, that approach. Um, and that's certainly the approach that we take. This is a collective effort from all of us. And so the pool testing is, is an example of that. Um, I also want to highlight just the reduction in disruption of learning that um, you guys alluded to. I remember Jill's slide from last year when she tried to talk about contact tracing and, and quarantining for entire sections of, of the school. And that was a huge endeavor to sort of think about. And this way we can reduce that amount of disruption to, um, to kids and classrooms. And that's a huge benefit. Um, and then two other pieces that um, you, you um, that just wanted to follow up and make really clear is that school testing, the pool testing can still be a benefit if not everyone opts in. We do want um, you know, maximum participation and it's more effective with maximum participation, but that shouldn't be a reason why we don't de decide it as an effort upon all the other ones um, if we don't have complete participation from um, every child. Um, and the second is that it's beneficial whether we're in a low transmission month <laughs> or a high transmission month. You know, our, our, our prevalence is sort of going up and down and unfortunately going up right now. Um, so even if we do um, better as far as prevalence in the community, this can still be a useful um, uh, layer of, of tool um, for all of us. And then the last piece I would emphasize is the testing itself. That was a super cute video of the kids swabbing themselves. Um, and, you know, I've seen kids do it myself in the office and they're quite, quite, you know, skilled at it now, unfortunately. Many of them have done them before. Many of them have done them in drive-throughs. And um, it's actually a lot easier to have a child swab themselves than have me try to stick that up their nose. And so they usually respond better to that. And then I love the, um, the sort of putting it into the, um, the little cup there and then washing our hands afterward. This is another example of sort of our collective effort as a classroom, as a child to participate in this and sort of um, be doing something for, for their class and their community. So um, I just wanna emphasize that element of it and certainly can take any questions later, but um, thank you for your time in discussing this with us. Uh, thanks, Dr. Santi. And I, I just wanna, while you're speaking with us, can I ask you a question? Um, you weren't here last time to weigh in and, and we'll get into this further, but um, what what's your sense or what have you heard or what have you seen in regards to the, the mental health impact of students having to do that on a weekly basis? So I certainly haven't read any studies about it. I, I'm not sure that those are out there. I could certainly, we could look into that. Um, I certainly know from just anecdotally and talking to patients and parents and things like that, that, um, you know, none of this is fun. You know, none of it at all is fun. Um, but the benefits of being in the classroom and doing it together with your classmates as, as a, you know, an effort together would certainly be better, you know, less scary to sort of become routine, quite frankly, um, as opposed to when you have to do it here and there when you're sick or when and, you know, some other symptom is going on. So I think the sadly normalization of it as a part of what we're doing in a classroom can actually really help with that. It's just sort of what we do, you know, like the masking was last year and, and right now it's, 
it's not as big a deal for, for the kids, though I, I understand that it certainly can be um, a challenge. So I think that part is just making it routine and really kind of highlighting the importance of it for the community would be the two things I would say. I haven't heard anything specifically of, of negative benefits from it, but I'm not sure that that exists out there in the literature. Thank you. And I, I've had some other people um, with myself included trying to find that literature, um, those studies, and they don't exist yet. I'm sure they will. There'll be thousands of studies after this, I'm sure. Um, we all want to know that stuff. But um, so my final question for you, Dr. Santi, then I'm going to go to the school nurses and then open up to any other questions. Um, and this is a tough question, um, but I think we need to answer tough questions. Uh, I've been asked this. Um, isn't this uh, in a way coercive? Um, parents want their kids in school, um, need their kids to be in school and maybe uh, for work. Um, isn't this co a coercive way to make them do this or have them do this? What are your thoughts on that? Wow, that is a tough question. I think, yeah. you know, depending on what angle you look at it, it kind of depends on what the answer would be. Um, I think it's sort of, you know, what the what the goal is is what are what is our shared vision and what is our shared goal um, and and this to me is one one of those measures so I suppose you know one could look at it in that way um, you know but I really think it's really about the safety of the classroom and the safety of sort of our our plan to get kids back um, so so I personally would, wouldn't view it that way but you know, I'm involved in a lot of things that aren't as un, as comfortable, you know, to have done. So I have a different perspective on it. But I think, like I said, I, I don't think it's coercive if you allow parents to opt in or out. Obviously, they ultimately have the choice in that. Um, but there are some consequences, certainly, as far as if there was a positive case. And, and I think that would be the case anyway, because of the CDC guidelines. So, um, so I don't believe so, but I could certainly understand that perspective. And, you know, we're, we're all doing the best we can to make it make it as safe as possible. So, um, appreciate the question though. Thank you and thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn to Aaron, uh, Aaron, Karen and Jill uh, for your thoughts again. And, and typically I, I appreciate that one of you tends to speak for all, but I think it's important because each age group has some different perspectives on this. Um, Jill, you did mention all three of you were on board on this and support it, um, but I did want to give uh, Karen and Aaron a chance to speak. So Karen, you're in, in the high school. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I know you shared last time, but just in case new people are listening, um, what are your thoughts on pooled testing at this point and any, anything else you want to add about um, the impact on kids doing it every, every week or uh, the coercive perhaps nature of it or uh, how we're going to prepare students to do this? Sure. Um... You know, I think the high school uh, poses some unique challenges just in terms of their scheduling. Uh, you know, we don't have a homeroom period per, per se. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of mingling of many students all throughout the day. So it's not like we just have one, um, one cohort or one, you know, classroom, you know, that we're going to be able to test. I think we have to look at it kind of as a school-wide approach of, you know, the pooled testing is more of a, um, an efficiency way of, you know, getting a handle on what's going on in the school as opposed to one specific classroom because there is so much intermingling among students. So I think we would definitely need a lot of planning. Um, that's certainly not insurmountable. I think we have great, a great, colleagues and, and um, people that will help um, plan the least disruptive strategy that we possibly can. Uh, we, we are benefited by uh, the vaccination. You know, everyone in the high school is eligible for vaccine, um, you know, based on the age criteria. Um, but I'm less confident in the protective value of vaccines. Over the last few weeks, it seems like there's been more and more breakthrough cases and um, having a pool testing um, protocol already in place, should that become even less effective, you know, it would kind of be nice to have that, um, to be able to be a little proactive about that rather than reactive if, you know, the Delta variant uh, becomes even more entangled in, um, you know, these young you know, these young students. So 
Uh, you know, I would say it's, you know, there's certainly obstacles. It seems a little daunting, but not unsurmountable. And um, it does seem uh, very strongly supported by the public health experts and their people I trust. So that's also another really um, deciding factor for me. Thank you, Karen. Appreciate it. Aaron at, at Pond Cove uh, with a very different population uh, than the high school. What are your what are your thoughts? Great. Um, so as we said earlier, it's another safety measure that we have in place for our schools, especially important at Pond Cove because our students aren't vaccinated. Um, and we are trying to bring, well, the plan is that we're bringing all of our students back together every day, five days a week. Um, distancing is going to be limited. Um, so we we're hoping to maintain about a three foot distance, but it's not a guarantee in some classrooms, depending on student numbers, extra um, materials that are in the classroom, bookcases, whatnot. Um, so it's, it's going to look very different than it did last year. Students will still be masked in the classrooms, um, but it's just one more safety measure of helping us to catch an early case before we have an outbreak in our schools. Um, so like Karen and Jill said earlier, it's definitely, um, I am in support of it. Um, it's a great public health measure. It's endorsed by the main CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, it just seems like one more safety measure to keep our schools open and our kids safe. Thanks, Erin. And before I move on from you, um, I know we're gonna get, you all are, will be trained heavily in how to do this, um, but what are your initial thoughts on preparing students to do it? Um, and preparing a classroom of, of kids to do this. What, uh, what, what are your initial, what's your initial thinking on that? Well, I'm definitely going to reach out to my two amazing school counselors, one who's on here with me, Ms. Gallagher. Um, but I would hope to put together some educational videos that we can share in each of the classrooms with the students, um, but also to share those informational tools with parents as well, and then helpful links, any information that we can get out there before we start this, just to make the transition much easier, put parents at ease, but also to make kids comfortable so they know what to expect. And then um, I think just having um, a presence of people that they really trust in the classrooms, especially since this will be new to them, it's going to be, they'll be with new teachers. So if they're seeing familiar faces like Mrs. Gallagher, Mrs. O'Neill, myself in the classrooms, that will help them hopefully as well through this process. Thanks, Aaron. And uh, Jill, you did a great job presenting, but anything you want to add from the middle school perspective? Um, I just um, tagging off, like kind of taking off from what Karen had mentioned about um, logistics, the middle school, we also have a lot of movement in our middle school, especially in our upper grade levels. And the only way we could reduce that is if we reduce course offerings. So, um, and we don't want to do that, I don't think. Um, <laughs> I don't make those decisions, but I think we want to have as normal of a year as we can. Um, but because of that movement, um, while we're testing in a homeroom, not, not a homeroom, I should stop saying homeroom, while we're testing in like a first period classroom, and if you participate in a pool in that first period classroom, even if you move throughout the building in eight other classrooms, we know that you're negative. Um, and so that would keep you in all of those classrooms, even though you were tested with your first period classroom. So, um, and cl close contacts would be identified in the same way that they were in the past. We haven't seen any um, updates on that yet, but um, so we'd still do that contact tracing throughout that individual who tested positive throughout their whole day, you know, from the time they get on that bus and, and then into their activities in the afternoon that are associated with school. So we would still do the same contact tracing, but if you're in a pool, no matter which class you're in that pool in, if you're negative, you're negative. So it does have that benefit, but we do have a lot of movement at the middle school to think about too. And if I, everyone's been very patient, but before I open this up, just one final question for the four of you that have been talking. Um, I've been asked this, and this is why I'm asking you, um, with pooled testing, someone may test positive or may, will test positive for this, and yet they can come back to school for one to two days after that um, while we're waiting for the pool results. Uh, how is that? Good practice. How is that safe? How how can we be assured that's safe? Um, I think I could answer that, but I want to hear from the four of you um, if you understand the question. Did you want to start with Dr. Santi on that, or did you? Sure, want to... absolutely. 
Actually, I start with you guys because you guys know that the, the system and the pool testing ins and outs better than I do. Sure, so pool testing, they're tested weekly. So we know that that individual that tested positive was negative the week prior. We also know that we have that screening checklist. And so all of our students coming and faculty coming into our building should be asymptomatic, so symptom free. And had we not done this pooled test, we wouldn't know anyway. So, and we could have others not participating in the pool, also asymptomatic attending school. So the rationale behind this from our public health experts, um, we don't make this up, but from the research that they've done and the information that they have is the viral load is likely very low at that time and um, is caught because of the PCR type test that is done before they're even symptomatic, we've caught it. And then they're gonna come back to school the next day to be tested You know, once we learn of this positive result and they should still be asymptomatic if they're coming back to school. So the idea is viral load is very low. We have all these other measures in place. Risk of transmission is low. So that's the rationale. And Erin and Karen, I'll let you chime in. I would add one other thing, which is masks, right? We've got masks as protection. And so that is that sort of uh, protection with a, in this setting. And it is actually really a good question because if you think about the Delta variant, obviously you hear lots of different things about it, but one of the things that you hear is, is very highly transmissible, but potentially less symptomatic, um, at least uh, initially. And so, you know, this pool testing is sort of that way of just keeping tabs on and checking on sort of the rate in the community in this way, even when their symptoms may come up a little bit later or be delayed. So it actually could be a benefit in that case to, to check, find things early. Thank you both. I just add to that, you know, kind of like all the other strategies, yeah, it would be perfect to have instant results on everybody right away. Um, you know, there might be a little bit of delayed, but like everything else and the Swiss cheese approach, you know, that it's, it's certainly going to be another layer. Is it perfect? No, but it's going to give another layer of, um, you know, prevention, mitigation, and uh, early intervention. Thank you, and uh, thanks for answering that. And I, I'm sorry to put you all on the spot with those questions, but uh, I appreciate you answering the tough questions because uh, that's what we're here to do. All right, everyone has been extremely patient in, in listening and learning uh, as we're all continuing to learn uh, learn all about this. So any further thoughts? Uh, I did want to add a little data or information I found out. Um, we haven't discovered any studies yet, as been has been mentioned. Um, I did. I was able to talk to the Lisbon superintendent um, and head of curriculum there, who's been running the testing there this summer. Um, they reported out. Um, yes, as been mentioned, it's not invasive, so the students are just going inside their nose. Um, they have no reports or no evidence that it's been stressful for the kids that have been involved at all. In fact, they said the kids have enjoyed it in some ways and find it funny and even mentioned the little boogers that are coming out. So that was kind of a cute story anyway. Um, they said what they did that worked really well is the nurses met with the kids uh, before they started and introduced it, talked about it, explained it, uh, talked about it to the parents. Um, and really, it was a concerted effort by everyone involved to support the kids, uh, let them know why we're doing it and that it's safe and okay and important. Um, and so it was really a wraparound approach for the kids involved. Um, and they really emphasized having mom and dad on board and, and talking to the kids that we're doing this to keep, it, keep you and others safe. Um, and they found they could do it in two minutes once they started getting up to speed, two minutes per classroom. So I found that interesting from Lisbon uh, and I appreciated them giving me that feedback. Uh, there's also seven districts in New York and Cumberland County that have decided to move ahead with this at this point, and six other districts are, are considering it, and that data I'll update more. So uh, there are other districts around us that are choosing to do this. All right, that's enough of me talking, and the nurses and the doctor will turn it over to questions, thoughts, comments. Um, who would like to share anything about pooled testing? I know you all shared last time, but uh, particularly around perhaps the the stress or mental health impact because uh, that, that's what uh, stopped us from moving forward last time. 
Laura, go ahead. Oh, you're muted. There you go. I'm out of practice. All right. Um, I want to thank all the nurses and Dr. Santi for all the information. To me, it seems like a very daunting process. Um, and I just, in trying to just picture what it looks like, I'm wondering if we're calling it a pool, is there a certain number that makes it a pool? Can you have one kid in a class? You know, especially thinking where people can opt in and out. And I know that the hope is probably that more people participate than, than not. But if, if it's a changing number or if it's a low number in a class, do we still call it a pool? Um, and then I, in regard to the mental health, I, I'm thinking of what Elizabeth Yarrington said last time, and I, I don't think she's on tonight, so I, I don't mean to speak for her if she's here, but just the stigma of kids doing it, if some kids aren't, and maybe, maybe the message at home is that this is not a good thing, or we think it's dumb or something like that, you know, that to me, that's more the, the issue of we don't, some families may not be seeing that as a good idea or making kids feel that way. I don't know. I'm just, I'm trying to imagine kids doing this and depending again, if the numbers are really high, then you would think everyone wants to do it. If the numbers are low, then it may feel like you shouldn't be doing it. So I, just some sort of thoughts that I'm having as we're talking about this. And I'm, I'm not, disregarding this at all i definitely lean toward the medical experts for sure but just some things i'm thinking of as we're talking about all these issues thanks laura could you just remind everyone in the audience who you are oh sure i am um, a middle school teacher i'm an interventionist for reading and math mostly working with fifth and sixth graders thank you and just to remind everyone when you speak just remind us who you are uh, anyone Nurse or doctor want to respond to Laura's comment about stigma? I think that's a really tough one. I think I totally agree with you, Laura. That's a, a possibility. I think it's how you set it up, you know, as, as the teacher and, and as the classroom. And then um, to the point of how many you need, um, I believe it's a minimum of five. Uh, you guys could correct me, Joel, is that correct? Yeah, so, um, and the reason is it's sort of like a sample size. You know, if you take a sample of something and then kind of extrapolate to the greater community, that's why um, a minimum of five. So, so we would think or hope that at least five in a classroom would be able to participate. Um, I, I think the teachers and maybe the school counselor would be, would be better served to answer this question of how you, you know, normalize something like this when there could be some differing opinions at home. There probably are other examples of that in the classroom, um, maybe not this, um, you know, difficult, but um, I think probably I'd use the same sort of uh, psychology behind that. I'm not a teacher or a, an expert in that, so. Well, in, in, in my rambling, I think I'm thinking it's more of a community cell or not a cell, but a presentation of for the community as opposed to just the, the students and obviously the parents are choosing for the students anyway, so. Thank you. And as we talk more, we can we can talk more about those good points, Laura, um, because it, it is going to take community effort and community communication and, and buy in and um, recognition that we're all trying to help each other. Um, I think, Bree, you were next or, and then we'll go to Kathy and then Jess. Hi, Bree Gallagher, school counselor at Pond Cove. Um, uh, first, I'll ask like, my question concern that relates to what Laura had just shared. Um, and, and with this is also a um, clarifying question that I know I had when I was reading about Massachusetts pool testing in the spring that they were, the nurses were the ones um, doing the swabs for under second grade. So I was just wanting to clarify, I kept hearing all students. So we're gonna be asking our little guys to do that too. Um, and then I, I keep thinking about consent and opting in and knowing that it's gonna be our parents that are making that decision and clearly framing and education of both our community, parents, teachers is gonna be really important as with our students. But I, I, I keep thinking about um, 
students that might come to school and their parents have opted them in, but they're not comfortable doing that. And obviously that's gonna be part partially my job as a school counselor to help a child work through that. But I, I just, I guess like uh, we've heard um, and the presentation was amazing and super helpful, but uh, I, I guess I just have a little bit, I'll be really honest that I have a worry that school is starting really soon. And it seems like to do this well and to get off the ground with it, there's gonna be a lot of legwork. So I just would wanna make sure that we like start as we wish to go and um, have time to do all of those pieces well. And then I had a really, what I think was probably a simple question is, what if there is a positive case that comes not from the pool testing? Would being part of the pool still keep you from needing to quarantine. So, sorry, that was a lot all in once. I probably should have asked that separately. <laughs> 17 questions wrapped into one. Uh, Karen, I saw you nodding about the last question from, from Brie. My, sure. So Karen Jenkins, the school nurse at the high school. Um, my understanding is if you're involved with pool testing, you're exempted from having to quarantine as a close contact, regardless of where the contact was. So you might, especially the high school where you might not be in the same pool per se, you might have been, maybe everyone in your pool was negative, but you're still a close contact based on someone who tested positive in a different pool, you're still exempt from that, from needing to quarantine. Um, I would have to double check, but I think that would also translate into if you had, say, a community contact or something, that that would also exempt you. But in other words, we're doing this weekly check to make sure nothing's turning positive, and that's, that's really where the exemption from quarantine comes in. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and Breed, answer your, or talk through your, your other questions about timing. Um, we want to do this right. We have to do this right. So we're not going to rush to do this day one if we're not ready. Um, we need to make sure everyone's trained. Um, we've get, given a time to share what this is with everybody um, and give everyone a chance to ask questions. So we're not rushing into this. We want to make sure everyone's trained and comfortable and we got this because uh, a lot of trust is being put into it in, into us as the educators in our schools and the healthcare providers in our schools. So we're gonna get this right. Um, we need to. Uh, Kathy and Jess and then Ingrid. So Kathy, go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Kathy Bach. I teach science at the high school. And I think Karen, you've sort of answered the question from Bree, cause that was sort of partially my question as well. So is the idea that we would test if you opted in for the pool that you would be tested every week or you know, let's say you know 400 kids in the high school want to be tested every week is that would all 400 be tested every week or we would we do a 200 here one week and then 200 the next week that's the first part of the question okay well let me go with that first part so my understanding is that Yes, every student involved with the testing program is tested every week. The whole advantage of this pool testing is you're not doing 400 separate tests. You're doing, I don't know, 400 divided by 20, whatever that is. I can't well, think it'd be, of it. Yeah, it'd be 20. Yeah. You'd have 20. So you would PCR maybe tests. do, right. So, um, right, all those different classroom pools would then be tested every week. So, yeah, the idea is you test um, every week. Uh, and there, there was some data I saw, I think the school nurse consultant reported out that now this was a month ago, maybe, but they said about one in a hundred pools is, was testing positive. That was kind of the data out of Massachusetts and sort of the summer school data. Now, granted with a Delta variant that may be shifting, but, um, you know, so it, okay. but yes, you would be tested every week. And it's not, it's not like you're testing that pool of close contacts. It's just a way of testing a lot of people more efficiently. Yeah, yeah, no, I totally, I totally get it. I was just, so, cause my, wh where my brain is, is trying to make this attractive for high school kids because a lot of them are vaccinated. You know, there's not a real benefit, you know, other than the let's help everybody out and let's keep it out of the schools sort of altruistic reason to be part of the pool. Um, so I guess my question is, let's say um, 
a kid in my period five class, their pool tested positive. I'm a close contact of that kid in that pool. Can I get tested through the school because I'm part of a pool, but not the pool? So if, okay, so you are, so you're involved with the pool testing program. Correct. Not directly involved with that pool that tested positive, but yes, you're Correct. still having weekly surveillance testing. You're exempt from quarantine. I'm exempt from quarantine, mm -hmm. but then the recommendation was, is now, is it a, it's three to five days I should oh. get, right? I, I'm supposed to get another test to oh. confirm. Yeah, so that would, that, my understanding, and again, well, you know, we all need a little more training on this as we, right, get, right. You know, if we decide to proceed, but um, is that that would cover you for that required test three to five days. Well, it's, it's a recommended test three to five days. Okay, so it is recommended. I'm, and I, that was my other question because I know I was quarantined last year and I, it was suggested I get a test and I couldn't get a test until I was done with quarantine. So, you know, that recommended versus need is, is kind of is important. And I but just that said, Kathy on the time frame. So when we send these PCRs out, since they are PCRs, it's about a 24 to 48 hour return. And if one comes back positive, then we're doing those individual tests. So that really puts us at, you know, probably within that three to five day window when you would be due for your next pooled testing. Okay. Um, you'd be within that window. And then um, a co contact of a close contact would not still be a close contact, but it's confusing. <laughs> it is confusing. It is confusing. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, I think Jess, you're up. Um, so thank you so much for this presentation. It's really helpful. Um, and I think the pool testing sounds so like a really helpful thing to do. Um, I think it's true that we have to think about the messaging for the high school students and I just wanted to add that um, the RAND report that was sent around, so the first author on there, um, Laura johnson Faraday, actually lives in our community. Um, and she, so I, I spoke to her and she's like very happy to be a resource if anyone, um, you know, if there are questions that come up. She's a pediatrician, but she does primarily research. Um, she has young kids who are not in the Cape schools yet. But um, so she, I, I asked her if she had any like, you know, in information that she would want me to convey. And she said one thing she wanted to have us take away was that the that report was done for like early adopters. And so um, the major the major difference in what they found that was helpful is when there was sort of like um, good resources, which we now have with like the main um, DOE supporting this. So you know that was probably the biggest challenge for schools was sort of figuring out this out on their own, which we don't have to do in this case. Um, another thing she just said is like the higher the participation rate, the better. Um, and that one of the key takeaways that they also um, sort of wanted to bring to light is just that the messaging is key in terms of getting good community buy-in. Um, she actually like gave a talk about messaging that she was going to share with me. And um, she said that um, just one message is, you know, it's easier to pull back later than to sort of to have to put something in place. So um, better to sort of have this going. I mean, I realize we need to get it right. And so school is starting soon, but like better to sort of have this be the plan. And then we can always pull back later if, you know, vaccines become more widely available or rates go down, but it's harder to sort of move in the opposite direction. Um, and then her last, um, something else she mentioned was that the, apparently the Wisconsin um, Public Health Department has a great website and they sort of have like very key timelines in terms of like when to do what messaging and start in terms of like four weeks before school starts, two weeks before. Um, so that, I haven't looked at it yet because I just spoke to her today, but it might be something that would be useful for us. Thanks, Jess. That's very helpful. And every time I think I turn around, I'm finding out there's another great resource in this, this community. It's amazing. Uh, and we're lucky to have everybody want to help out so much. So thank you. I, I'd like to hear more from her, Jess, if you can. Yeah, I can put you in touch for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Did that. Ingrid, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Before we do that, Jess, can you remind everyone? Uh, 
Oh, world. sorry. Yep. Um, I am a pediatrician in the community and I have um, two kids and um, one is entering first grade and the other is four. So he'll be there eventually. Thanks. Ingrid, go ahead, please. Hi, I'm Ingrid Whitaker and I teach uh, fourth grade. So I'm from the elementary school and, and have um, we have a lot of experience working with uh, younger uh, children in the school population. And a couple of things that come to mind when I, when I think about them, are, what are two things that are really important to young children? One is they really wanna be in school and they also wanna know that the adults there will keep them safe. So I think if it's presented to them as this is something that's gonna help keep us all in school and five days a week, and it's helped to help it keep you safe, uh, they'll be on board with that. We're used to introducing all kinds of, of different new protocols and things as we've had to make adaptations due to COVID. And so much of it is how it's presented to, uh, I think everybody, but i um, thinking particularly about uh, the students in the age that we work with. I know at the beginning of the last school year, um, our school nurses and guidance counselors uh, provided a classroom teachers with some fantastic videos that were really appropriate for that age student. And that was really helpful in answering their questions and reassuring them. So I think presented in that light uh, and knowing how much they are wanting to be in school uh, then and how much they're probably hearing at home about COVID and maybe getting a little bit scared uh, that this might be something that's actually reassuring to them as well um, as a way this, this is a way to help keep us all safer and keep us all in school so uh, and as far as the question about uh, parents and making sure I think uh, it's going to be really important that parents make sure their child is on board with testing and they opt them into it so if we can provide parents with some talking points uh, for addressing this with their child I think that would be really helpful Thank you, Ingrid, for uh, providing a classroom mm -hmm. teacher perspective. That's very helpful. And you're right. Uh, kids want to know we're going to keep them safe. Um, that's so important. All right. We've had, a, I think, a chance for anyone that wanted to say something or ask something. Um, and there are some unknowns, right? We, this, is, this would be new for us. Um, I think you all have proven last year that you're very capable of, of in, instituting um, new approaches and, and trying to keep kids safe. And I have the utmost confidence in our nurses and our staff that we can do this and do it well. Um, and we will figure out the social and emotional part, how to support kids. Um, and, and things will happen and we'll have to work through them. That's true of any, any school day pre-COVID or post-COVID, like things happen where students need support. Um, and I, I think our staff will rise to that challenge and, and we'll help them do it. Um, so Michelle, a uh, question or, or two that you're seeing or a comment? Yeah, I think that uh, some have been answered, had been answered, but questions in the um, chat, I see uh, why the question, and I hear this other places, why can't children get a negative test uh, and be admitted back to class. So I think this is in reference to students who are, who are not participating in the pool testing. Um, but if they were to get their own negative test, why can't they come back in? Why is it only the pool tested students who can come back in? I, I can try to speak to that. Um, the children who are in the pool testing is part, they're part of our su surveillance monitoring. So every week those kids are getting tested. Whereas another student, if they are identified as a close contact to a positive case, they go to get tested. That's a snapshot of them that one day. Whereas the kids in the pool testing, we know they were tested, say their pool gets tested on Monday. We know there's a positive case. They're going to, they test negative with a rapid test on Tuesday when we get the results back of that pool. We know that those kids are then going to get it tested again the following Monday, whereas a student who's not in the pool is identified as a close contact, goes and gets a test. They may have been tested too soon, so they may not have enough viral load on board. They get tested. That test comes back negative. They think that they're all set. They come back to school, but we find out three, four or five days later, either 
they develop symptoms or they are an asymptomatic carrier and we start to see more positive cases in that classroom. So it, their one test is just a snapshot versus the children who enrolled in that pooled test who are getting weekly surveillance tests. Does that make sense? I'll just add that that's CDC, main CDC and federal CDC guidance for close contacts. Um, if your child is not a close contact, but is symptomatic, um, our school guidance um, as of last year is that you keep your child home and you follow up with your provider. We did not require testing, but oftentimes, but we did require if you were symptomatic um, based on our checklist and had either two of the less common symptoms or one of the more common symptoms that you follow up with your doctor to get a note before coming back to school. And some of and most of, we didn't require a test, but most of the time when they would go to their provider and they met that criteria, and that's why they're at their provider, most providers would end up testing. But if they had a negative test and symptoms were improving, oftentimes the doctor would write the note for them to return. So the negative test in that situation usually would result as long as symptoms were improving and their doctor clearing them to return. I believe they, this individual must have been asking about those identified as a close contact and having a negative test. Um, right now, this, you do not test out based on CDC guidance. Thank you both. Michelle, any other Quick questions. It's a question that we we've heard before about accommodations, if any, are available for neurodiverse um, students. If there were accommodations for students um, who may have other um, compromised immune situations. Michelle, I read that question a little bit differently, and I think they referenced me in the question. I think what that question was alluding to was perhaps a student with some sensory concerns or oh, right. anxiety or um, something that was making that perhaps is a family that would like to be involved in the pool testing, but's concerned about how their child's going to react to it. And, and you know, obviously I'm, I'm newer to this pool testing game and trying to formulate my own thoughts about it and how I would help students, but I, th I think it's similar to like a student that um, obviously we have a procedure for students entering the building when they arrive to school, right? Like ideally kids could jump off the circle, they walk in, they go to their teacher's classroom, right? They like, that's how the flow works. But if there's a student that is struggling with that, especially at first, then there's school counselors, there's extra staff, there's nurses, there's people there to check in with them and, and help to make that process go as smooth as possible with supports for as long as they need to. So I think that, you know, that as a school counselor, my answer would be that, you know, I'd be wanting to work really, and I'm, I'm assuming all the other school counselors and social workers would say the same, that we wanna be working really closely with the school nurses and figuring out how we can support them kind of at that tier one for all kids. Um, and as Ingrid said, helping with videos and messaging, but then also from that like tier two, tier three, kids that are struggling or kids that are presenting as nervous, how we can help them to access that weekly testing with um, as, as smoothly as possible. And, and I will just throw out that could look like, you know, um, maybe an alternative, maybe they get tested in, in my office if that's a familiar spot for them. I don't, I don't even know if that's true, but those are like the sort of things that at school that we do, right? We figure out how we can make kids as comfortable as possible. So hopefully that answers the question. And Michelle, maybe I was wrong. That wasn't what they were asking. Um, so sorry if I interjected. That was totally it. I'm sorry, I reread it. And of course that was it, yes. So if this moves forward from this committee, um, which I, I do wanna get to that, um, and then the school board endorses it. Situations like that, we'll, we'll be working closely with families that want help and guidance. Um, I think Bree's absolutely right with the school nurse, the social worker, the school counselor, the teacher, uh, whoever needs to be involved to help make this work. So thank you. So we've had a chance to uh, hear from our medical experts, um, from Dr. Shaw on down. Um, they're all endorsing moving forward with this. Um, I think we've tried to address the concerns that were raised on the uh, August 4th meeting. Um, I know we don't have all, all the answers specifically, but uh, I'm hearing we're, we're, we have wraparound approach. We're going to try very hard to uh, engage parents and the community and students and really explain what this is and how it works and really bring some comfort and some purpose to this. 
um, because the more that participate, the better for all. Um, so I'm really at this point, I, I'm ready to move this forward to the school school board, but I want to make sure um, everyone on the screen uh, can concur with that. Um, and I know some of you still have some questions, but are, are you willing to at least move this forward to the school board for their consideration uh, to offer another layer to this pro approach to keep all kids in school and students and staff safe. So uh, if you don't say anything at this point, I, I'm taking that as a yes, uh, I'm okay with moving this forward. Um, knowing all the questions we still have to answer, knowing the training we will do. Um, so seeing uh, no further comments, um, I'm gonna say, let's move this forward for school board consideration on Monday evening. Uh, I believe Jill, uh, you're attending Monday evening um, to help uh, answer questions and present again, uh, cause that will be another audience for us to talk about this and get the word out. Um, and so thank you. So that's two recommendations so far from this, from this group that are going forward for Monday night. Uh, that's universal masking for all, no matter vaccination status. And it's also uh, pooled testing for everyone K-12 on a voluntary basis. All right, thank you. So it's almost eight, but we have a few more things to talk about. Um, and I think this, hopefully, I think this will be quicker. Um, oops, I lost what I want. Shoot. Uh, so we're going to go to the other mitigation factors. Um, last time we started talking about social distancing, um, and we really have no more guidance from the state. SOP has not come out yet unless it came out, and I didn't see it today. Um, what we've heard about social distancing is do the very best you can, uh, but we want all kids in school this, this school year. We've heard that from the DOE. We've heard that from the CDC. Um, so what that means in terms of busing, um, we'd like to have as much social distancing as possible, but uh, have every student uh, on one run. Um, the reason why one run is to uh, maximize learning. Um, so we've asked parents to participate in the transportation survey by the 16th to tell us who wants to ride a bus. So please do that, parents. Um, and our, every... Uh, we're gonna make every effort to have one run uh, to maximize learning. Um, and that may mean there's two kids in each seat, but we'll have windows open um, and hand sanitizer and do the same things we did last year. So I'm gonna do this rapidly people. So if you have a question or comment about transportation, please raise your hand. Um, otherwise we're gonna go forward with that plan of one bus run with as much social distancing as possible. Uh, Dave, I see you nodding. Um, so it's nice to have you here tonight, Dave, uh, from facilities. So, so that's busing in terms of classrooms. Actually, I'll do cafeteria first. Uh, uh, we, I've talked and the nurses have with the whole administrative team, the district leadership team. Our aim is to have three foot distancing um, in the cafeterias. Um, we think we can do it. They've done some measurements. Um, we're trying to have as regular lunches as possible, again, to maximize learning. Um, facilities wise, I think, Dave, you've been part of that. Um, but anyone on this group have any questions about three foot distancing with seating charts uh, for cafeteria uh, eating? Are we in support of that? Silence means support. So, all right. And please speak up. I want to encourage you, if you have a question, please speak up or comment. So in terms of classrooms, um, uh, Dave, this is when I am, am going to ask you to speak a little bit um, in terms of classroom setup. Uh, I know we go back a year and a half ago, classrooms look differently. Then we move different furniture in, and now we're moving some other furniture back in. Um, our aim is to have students at three foot distance in the classrooms, if that's possible. But again, uh, the number one thing is to get as many all of our kids in school um, this school year. So, Dave, can you talk a little bit about furniture, uh, what your your crew has been up to? And I do appreciate all their work in the hot summer. That's not fun. Um, so thank you, maintenance and custodial crews. Um, so just your comments, Dave, on what's happened so far and what you see happening the first week staff are back. 
Uh, thank you. Yeah, I, we do feel pretty confident. We're, we're going to have to get creative. You know, it might not be desks in every classroom spaced out. There may be scenarios where we're using tables and maybe putting a uh, tape down the middle. Um, but, you know, I, we feel confident that we can get the three, the three feet apart. Um, we also, you know, as a community need to feel good about our ventilation system that we put in. It's the newest, latest, and greatest technology, uh, needle point ionization um, and UV lights. Um, so we're feeling pretty good. I, we need, I need to get the exact kind of um, classroom sizes for the Pond Cove. Um, I know those rooms seem to be a little bit, a couple funky designs, um, but in the high school, um, I'm feeling pretty confident about the three feet. <clears throat> Thanks, Dave. And Certainly any admin that wants to speak up about this, that, that's fine too. Kathy, go ahead. So, I mean, what, what, where are we with like a lab station um, or group work where you're going to be closer than three feet together? It's, you know, you, we don't have lab stations so that every kid can have their own, um, which is what we did last year with, you know, only Right, right. And I know you raised that question last time and it's a great one. Uh, we want students to be engaged in, in, in their coursework and, and learning. Um, but we also need to be as safe as possible. So I'm glad Dr. Santi you're here with us tonight um, or others, but um, I'd like the opportunity for lab partners to work together this year, but I, I wanna be told if that, that makes sense. Um, of course, we'll be masked. Um, try to distance as much as possible in Kathy's lab, but if they're within two feet doing a lab for a, f a few minutes, is, is that okay? Well, um, it, it would it would be more than a few minutes. Like yeah. if you're doing a, an AP Chem lab or something right, like true, that, true. it's yeah. it's you know potentially it's at least 50 minutes. And for like an AP Biology lab, it could be two periods. So it could be longer than that yep it's a good question kathy i know where i'm feeling as superintendent that i want those to advance forward and i want our kids engaged in their learning again i think that's so important um we are masked we are hopefully doing um the the, the testing or at least some students are involved in the testing uh, many high school students are also vaccinated um so i'm feeling confident we can do that um and we will have seating charts. So Kathy, you will know where those kids are, correct? Right. 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 So Dr. Santi, another tough question coming your way. You'll never attend the meeting again. Uh, but what, what are your thoughts? Do you agree with me or disagree with me? And you can disagree with me. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, I think you're on the right track when you, when you uh, reviewed the CDC guidelines, that's basically do the best you can when you can. And if there's periods of times where you need to be closer together, I think you know, you want to minimize those, you know, certainly as much as possible. And so if there are alternative ways to do lab activities and things, obviously, um, we've been creative before, and those could certainly be um, ideally recommended. But you know, if there are some things that you do just have to do together, you know, I would just ensure everyone is masked and, you know, hand washing and hand hygiene before and after. So um, that would be what I would suggest. Uh, go ahead, Jess. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. And I think one thing that this just brings to mind for me is that especially in the age groups where that is relevant, those are kids that are eligible for the vaccines. Hmm. And so, you know, I would, I hope that as many kids as possible are vaccinated. I mean, and parents and kids have the ability to make the choice for their own child to vaccinate their child. Um, I think one thing that's a little hard is if you're worrying that, you know, they're working with another student who is not vaccinated which we, I don't, you know, there's no way that we would be able to control for that kind of situation. But that leads me to the fact that I'm still hearing a lot of misinformation in my office from families about their thoughts on the vaccines. Um, and it's definitely something that I really struggle with. And it's not something that I feel like, you know, I alone in my office can do enough about. I think it's more something that needs to come from like the community and I, so I'm hoping also that there'll still be opportunities for like education for families around vaccination um, and just helping sort of the cause, because I think that the more 
that people hear about these things from different like trusted resources in their community, the better. Um, but it's definitely still like a real, it's a real issue um, that I hear about a lot. And I know it's, you know, I know we're probably all hearing it um, in different ways, but the more that we can help get our rates of vaccine really high, the better. Yeah, thanks, Jess, for reminding us of that. And uh, school district certainly supports the recommendation that students are, are vaccinated and we will support having clinics uh, this fall if there's booster shots that need to happen or if hopefully uh, the younger kids can get vaccinated this fall, we will I hopefully be first in line to offer a clinic, um, definitely. Laura, go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to say that the, the question of the group work is really relevant for everybody because we want to be able to do small groups if we can. We can share materials this year. So I, I think it just needs to be very clear to all the teachers because, for instance, I'm working on summer proposals meeting with teachers next week and we want to plan. So can we pull small groups after we do a mini lesson? You know, can we sit at tables together and, and work on things? I just whichever way it is, we just really need to know and be very clear one way or the other if we're doing this or if we're not. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, clarity matters. Um, and I think there is a difference between our vaccinated population and not. Um, but I, I want to meet with the nurses again after this, um, not tonight nurses, but uh, after this and, and get their feedback on this. So Laura, I can, I can help share that message and we're clear uh, as you plan and as we start the school year, we will be very clear with what's okay and what isn't. Um, so thank you. Um, but as I said at the start of this, I, I really want teachers as much as possible to re-engage with the excellent teaching that happens in this district. We need to um, COVID matters. It is important. We need to be safe, but we need to get back to teaching and learning as well. Um, I think there's an and there this year that I, I like. All right. Um, any other comments on, on distancing? Um, and hopefully we'll get guidance that that SOP was, uh, was promised to us, uh, this, this week. So maybe it will come out tomorrow, uh, from the, from the state. Uh, Karen, go ahead. I was going to say, um, got an email from the school nurse consultant. So I think it was what 620 or something, Aaron, that there the SOP has just come out. Um, I haven't obviously had a chance to look at it, but <clears throat> the highlights that she shared was if you're in a in an institution that is enforcing masking indoors consistently and you can maintain three foot distancing, that that does change your quarantine requirements for close contacts. Um, so that three foot distancing assigned seating is gonna be beneficial to us moving forward. And that's not, to, that's a different message than you have to maintain three foot. It's just right. there's advantages that you, that that three foot distancing can give you. You know, which I think still like Pond Cove, you know, they're all intermingling. That's just not realistic in terms of how they learn. But, um, you know, there are some settings. So anyway, the SOP, the standard operating procedure, which um, uh, defines what we do if we have a positive case in the school, who's a close contact, what you do about them, that is hot off the press this evening. So just to let you know that. And I said it would be on the toolkit sometime today, but I don't think it's quite there yet. Great, thank you. That's great news, actually. That will help us. Um, all right, I'm just going to try to share again here. Sorry. Um, so we've talked about uh, distancing um, volunteers. Um, I'm going to just say this at this point. We we love our volunteers. They're vital. Um, they're really important. Um, but at this point, with the Delta variant. Um, we're not, and I'll speak, I spoke with the school nurses and, uh, about this, but we're not comfortable having volunteers back in our buildings yet um, with the Delta variant um, increasing so much. Uh, we will try to be creative though. Maybe there's some other ways for our volunteers to help out. Um, maybe uh, with our technology or maybe there's things we can um, do outside, um, but we'll get back to that. So at this point, volunteers, uh, will not be back in our buildings. Um, 
but hopefully in the future, near future, they will be field trips. Uh, we talked about those uh, with the district leadership team and nurses yesterday. Um, we are of the feeling that outdoor field trips are, are still useful and possible and would be a great thing for our kids to engage in. Um, so we, we think that's a good endorsement. Um, again, raise your hand if you have a comment on that. Um, we're not feeling comfortable about sending kids for indoor field trips yet where they'd be intermingling with other communities. Um, the SOP, Karen, you just answered that. Thank you. Uh, that's great news. I've been looking forward to that. Athletics, um, Jeff, I know you've been hanging in here listening. I think you're still on here. Um, we believe uh, concessions uh, will be possible, obviously, with safety parameters and food service parameters that are, are uh, every restaurant and our own food service does. Uh, we think concessions can begin again um, with boosters. Um, for locker rooms, we again talked about that. We think we can utilize those again, um, obviously, with kids wearing masks and staying three feet apart. Um, and we're going to ask, obviously, our coaches um, and athletic director and others to make sure that that goes well and kids are well trained how to do that. Um, Jeff, you you asked about gym capacity, and I don't know if the SOP has anything about capacity, um, but I, I have heard nothing about uh, capacity limits inside other than trying to maintain three foot distance. Um, and I believe at least outdoor spectators, of course, will be welcome back as they were um, in the spring. Uh, Jeff, do you want to comment anything on your plans for training coaches and making sure they're on board and players are on board for safety this, this fall? Um, <clears throat> so we'll, fortunately, having some experience from uh, last year, um, we've got a really, a really strong plan that we've outlined and used. I think that's effective with beginning with a self-screening. Um, and then um, all the coaches have to take a COVID course, and that's a requirement through the Maine Principals Association. Um, and then we check students in, take attendance um, for each practice. And again, that's for screening purposes as well. Um, and a lot of conversations with kids, whether it's in larger groups or individually about um, some of the safety protocols, whether hand sanitizer or masks and um, attendance on the bus, sign seating, things like that. So I, I feel really confident that um, at the high school and middle school, we'll be ready, ready to go and, and do this right and do it safely. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, we can talk about this more, but I'm, I guess I'm in the mood tonight to put people <laughs> on the spot. A little bit. Uh, I'm thinking of your teams and the coaches and the potential positive influence they could have with the players on at least helping the players learn about pool testing, not to coerce them at all. Um, but just, um, just in terms of informing them, um, do you think that's a possibility to help us get the information out? A absolutely. Yep, for sure, 100%. Okay. Uh, that's something that we can begin having those discussions at the high school level on Monday, August 16th. It's time, right? Yes, Let's go. Is. We're back. Let's go. All right. Uh, Couple other things I want to talk about, and then we're going to close this meeting. It's been a, a, a full meeting and a, a long day for all of us. Bree, go ahead. I just wanted to ask a quick question about the volunteers. Does that yeah. does that mean visitors in general? Like, especially at the elementary level, we have to have parents running things in or maybe wanting to walk a child to the classroom. So I just want to be, I just like looking for a little bit of clarity on what, what yeah, that means. Yeah. Thank you. I, I meant to say, uh, volunteers and visitors. Um, at this point, we're going to continue the same practices we're using in the spring in terms of visitors to the schools. Because um, again, it's it's minimizing uh, interaction from outside people. And I know that there's going to be a question about uh, uh, 
um, open house. Um, we haven't determined that yet, but that uh, we'll figure that out. Um, so at this point, starting day one, September 1st, we're not allowing visitors or volunteers into our building. And again, all of this can be re revisited and will be revisited with more information. Um, I think we've got to do our part as best we can to keep our building safe, our kids safe, our staff safe, and so everyone can stay in school. That's our mission. That's our mission. All right, we're almost done this thing. I'm really pleased everyone could hang in there. All right, what do we have left here? Let me get my screen again. All right, so we talked about field trips, volunteers, athletic, um, review of recommendations. So last time we were gonna uh, recommend to the school committee universal masking. We've added to that tonight. We're gonna recommend um, we implement pooled testing K-12 for staff and students on a voluntary basis. Um, those are the two solid recommendations. I will also review with the school board on uh, Monday night, um, just what we've talked about in terms of distancing, um, athletics, um, all the things we've talked about, volunteers, visitors, and just share with them um, where we're at on those. So that meeting's on the 16th. Um, it's 6.30 downstairs here. Well, it's downstairs for me, not for you. Uh, and I will be asking for another meeting in September for this group. Um, I want to have a chance to review how things are going, let the public hear us review that. Um, I really aim to be transparent with this. Um, it's uh, complicated work, but so important to keep our kids and staff safe and keep our schools open. Um, and really, I hope, I hope, I hope, uh, once we've made some choices about uh, masks and pool, pool testing, we can shift to teaching and learning. Um, I know kids are hungry for it and staff are hungry for it to really get back to what we're, we're really great at. And that's, that's teaching and learning. So any final comments, uh, questions, anything on percolating that you need to need to say and get off your chest. All right. Well, thank you everyone for your participation. This is so valuable. Um, Dr. Santi, thank you for giving us your expertise and time. School nurses, you are rock stars. I was told that when I joined this district that you would think the nurses were rock stars and you are. So thank you for helping keep us safe and being leaders. Um, the rest of you, thanks for participating, sharing, uh, offering your ideas and those at home, thank you for listening. Um, we're in this together. Um, we need to be united, I think, as a community. I know there were some struggles last spring and some unfortunate tension developed. Uh, I want to get us back to being unified about uh, having our kids in school and teaching and learning and celebrating the good, uh, all that's good in Cape Elizabeth. So we're going to get there. We're going to get through this together. So thank you. Good night. Appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of your August. Night, everybody.